Hello, hello, hello. hello. So before we get started, one uh, commercial chat slash disclaimer. So there is a, an approach you take for engaging with our speakers, and this is week two, so it's all new to people. Last week I had one $5 person because they did the appropriate thing. Who was that person last week, and why don't you demonstrate what you did? Yes, sir, and you are? Daniel Smith, this is Mark Lee Senior. Thank you, and that, he did get $4 last week, a dollar a day, so I covered my five. So tonight in our con interaction we had one other person. Who was that person? Yes, you are. Robert Meyer, Senior Study Mechanical Engineering. Okay, so our Robert, five, unfortunately, I did have five dollars, Robert, I stuck in one pocket. <laughs> now, just to de disincentivize you, I will not be giving out five dollars every week. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't go broke, but uh, I may do other things occasionally. The point would be just to make symbolic recognition that it is something we'll be intentional about. Uh, Mark Pullum's here, former, uh, I'll call him a PLP alumni. Mark helped us actually put in the McKinsey case several years ago in decision making. But the point is, in short, uh, is that it distinguishes you. And so we've got a number of very, very positive stories about professionals who come to speak. As our presenter for Fidelity will tonight, and the team is here, who remember that, that distinction of standing up, who am I, what do I do in terms of major? And as simple as small as may be, we've got stories of people getting leads on job opportunities because they were presenting to two or three hundred students here on this campus. And the only people who stood up and introduced themselves were from PLP. Professionalism, poison presence. They presented that. So I just want to kind of illustrate that. I do thank you guys for demonstrating that. It's not to shame anybody because we don't do that. But it is to kind of show you from a role model standpoint, it does make a difference. And so with that, I'm going to pass off to the program going, but I would like to have you guys start to practice that protocol here and anywhere else. And believe me, it does pay off. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you guys for coming. Um, tonight, we have Ms. Kelly Lehman from Fidelity. She's also in the personal investing group uh, with Fidelity Investments. Uh, Ms. Christian Jones, actually, is funny. When she came in here, I remembered her from a, an elevator speech class that I had actually kind of attended last year. So she's also, uh, kind of, to Billy's point, phenomenal at kind of speaking and getting you guys to give a good pitch. Um, and Mr. Mark Holm, who you know, I'm sure you guys have all seen around the business building here and there, uh, now Fidelity. And uh, we're, we're very thankful to have him here. And I uh, hope you guys, you know, obviously, kind of really engage here. Um, and I think this is actually a great first lesson to master your money, because no matter what major we are, kind of like we talked about last week, whether it be engineering, uh, you know, biology, whatever, everybody hopefully will make some money to live off of. And in order to do, in order to do that, uh, it's, it's obviously a good idea to not manage it. So if you guys would please help me welcome these guys. Thank you. I'd like to say good evening to everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Pullum, as you mentioned, and I wanted to uh, preempt uh, Kelly um, with a couple of things. Number one, uh, we are very happy to be here. Number two, I did formerly work here at UNT in the Career Center, so I'm very much a part of the UNT family. I live in Denton, and I know some of your faces, and it's always good to see familiar faces. I, I want you to know that UNT has a special relationship with Fidelity Investments, and that the program that you are in speaks volumes to who you are as a person and as a student. Whether you know it or not, uh, this program is very well respected within the business community in regards to how they, how we do recruiting. I'm the director of university recruiting. So that means that on every college campus that's in the Southwest, whether it's in Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, or Texas, that's my region for recruiting students that come into Fidelity. Our office in Westlake. We have over 44,000 employees worldwide. We have more than 6,000 in Westlake. PLP is a very important program to us. If, if our EVP, Executive Vice President Mike Slovak, could have his way, he would hire every PLP graduate just because what Billy and um, Rachel do with you guys and teach you guys and the things that they bring in. So understand the pedigree of the program that you're in and the expectation that you should be trying to rise to because for those that came uh, before you and those that will come behind you are building a reputation that steps up at each time. Kelly has come all the way down from Boston and so that, that's how important it is for us to be engaged with this group. So this is, uh, and Kristen, she's a current uh, graduate student here. Uh, so it's very important our relationship. We have more than 600 UNT alums at our Westlake campus. 
out of 6,000, about 10%. That's more than any other school in the nation that we recruit at. So again, understand who you are, the program that you're in, and the things that he's teaching you, he's absolutely correct. It makes the, 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 the biggest difference that you could ever imagine. But here's Kelly. Awesome, thanks Mark. Hey guys, how are you? Yeah. Good, everyone good? Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I just heard your dean speak. Man, she's awesome, huh? That was so cool. I mean, I don't even know the name of my dean from undergrad, and the fact that she just invited you guys all to go to her office, I think that's awesome. Um, I've heard so much about your program, and I'm just so excited to have this opportunity to speak to you about a few things today. Um, before we start, I really liked that stand-up thing by your two classmates. Someone want to do that for me? Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Energy speech senior. Awesome, you rock! I don't have any cash. I don't think I could actually give you cash or I'd get fired, but here you go. First prize of the day. I love giving away things and I want to be included in that, so I'm very excited I just got the opportunity. Um, so a little bit about myself. As Mark said, I flew down here this morning from Boston. Is anyone from Boston? I know most of you guys are from Texas. Is anyone from not from Texas? Yeah, where are you from in the back? You raise your hand first. Dirty. Nice. Dirty jurors. I'm a Patriots fan though. Are you a Giants fan? Patriots. No way! That's awesome. Is anyone else a Patriots fan here? You in the back? Okay, well, pink shirt. Ooh, awesome! One more prize for you. Here, what's your name? Stand up. Susan Cleary, finance and data analyst. Nice, awesome. So actually, my Uber driver today, his, his brother plays for the Patriots. So it's kind of a trip. Um, and so your dean also said you guys have almost 40,000 undergrads who go here. Um, I actually went to a small school up in New York um, called Union College. Anyone familiar with it? You've heard of it? Awesome, man. Yeah. Pink shirt, awesome. You're awesome too. So Caesar, right? Yes, okay, sir. Caesar, great. That really makes me happy. Um, Union, 2,000 undergrads. Okay, your school here. I mean, I've never heard of as many parking issues as I just heard a few minutes ago. <laughs> it was insane. I think we talked for 15 minutes about the cost of a parking space, which is $1,200, by the way. Um, Union, I mean, you could walk from point A to point B, and it wasn't an issue, so that was shocking to me. Um, I played a sport there. I was actually a Division One athlete. Does anyone want to guess what sport I played? No. Lacrosse. No. Field hockey. No. No. Come on, Texas. Think of something that's up north that you don't necessarily have here. Hockey. Yes. I was an ice hockey player. I played Division One ice hockey player up in New York. Um, I hope that's shock and not like, oh god, ice hockey player. Have on my teeth. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so I went to a school uh, union. I was actually a double major in history and political science. Is so anyone a history or political science major here? Some of you guys, some of you guys. Yeah, so what can you do with that major? I found out not much. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to be a history teacher. I didn't want to go, you know, in government or anything like that. So it was a real shock for me. So coming out of college, I actually got into the hospitality industry. I was a general manager in Boston um, at a restaurant there. Uh, I did that for four years. And then after that, I went back to business school and I got my MBA. And there I was introduced to the topic of finance and business. Blew my mind. So I gotta be honest with you guys, I knew absolutely nothing when I got out of college. Union's also a liberal arts school. So coming out of that, I felt lost. There were so many times when I literally said to myself, and anyone who listened to me, because I'm a loud person, as you're already probably catching on to, what the heck did I learn in four years? What did they teach me? What was I doing for four years? Yes, I was playing hockey, but what was I really learning? Because those life lessons, those important kind of personal finance goals and lessons that are so essential post-graduation, they simply weren't taught to me. And to be honest, they're not taught in a lot of colleges, campuses across the country. And that's where Fidelity came in. And we've actually created a personal finance workshop that I'm actually going to introduce you to today. I'm going to share with you a lot of information around five particular topics, which we'll get into in a second. These are topics that recent graduates actually told us, hey, if we had just learned a little bit more about this in college, we would have felt so much more confident post-graduation. And the point of today's lecture is not necessarily for you guys to walk out of here knowing everything. I'm gonna guarantee you do not remember everything I teach you today, and that is fine. But if you guys can walk away after today's session remembering one thing, or two things, or you actually go and have a conversation with a professor, or a parent, or a trusted source in your life about some of these things, that's real success to us. You can always come ask us questions. I will give you my email after today's session. We're always here to help. But really, the point of today's session is to introduce you to a few things and just to get you guys thinking. To get you guys thinking of life post-college. Because the real world, it's awesome, but it also kind of stinks compared to college. 
Is anyone shocked by that? No, college is awesome. College is so fun. But the real world is as well. And what we want to introduce, introduce you to today is some concepts that can help you really achieve all the goals and have all the fun that you want to have post-college. Okay? So if you guys have any questions, raise your hand throughout the session. We're going to try to save a little time after today's session um, for Q&A. Um, we always seem to run out of time because um, you know that's what happens. So please feel free to interrupt, raise your hand, stand up, introduce yourself, and that's what we're here to today. All right. So I've got my trusty pointer right here. So as Mark and others already said, I work at Fidelity Investments. Has anyone here heard of Fidelity prior to today's session? Okay, awesome, that's awesome, that is great. Um, there's some schools that go across the country and people are like, what's Fidelity? I've never even heard of you before. And that's fine, and that, that's really the point. And really Fidelity, we've been around for 70 years, this is our 70th anniversary, and our whole goal is helping people just like yourselves really obtain those financial features and financial goals to live the life that they want, to achieve the goals in life that they need in order to live the life that they truly makes them happy. That's really the point of all that we do. Um, that's it's put very simply, but that's really what we do at Fidelity Investments. I hope one day all you guys work there someday. Um, but of course, even if you don't work there, we're always here to help you. But if you have a financial firm, if you have a bank, if you have trusted sources that you go to now, keep on doing that. I will talk a lot about Fidelity today just because I work there and I know a lot about it. But that doesn't mean Fidelity do or die by any means. It just means that that's my experience and that's what I'm sharing with you guys today. Okay, so as I already mentioned, with today's workshop, really the goal is to help you guys make smart choices with what you got. And as college students, let's be honest, it's sometimes not that much. I had zero money when I got to college. Um, I had zero money in college. Um, it was often a struggle. I played hockey and I was able to eat off the food that my hockey team gave me, and, and that's just the reality of being a college student. But the important thing is that you can do a lot with that money, and you can budget appropriately, and you can really set yourself up for success now even though it feels a million years off. All right, so we're gonna do something a little bit different. Does everyone have their cell phones with them? Yeah, okay, this isn't professional service behavior, not by any means, but I want everyone to take out their cell phones, okay? Take out their cell phones, even though for some reason I get zero service at the University of Texas. And I'm gonna ask you guys a question. What would you do with $1,000? If I came up to each of you guys and put $1,000 on the desk before you, what would you do with it? Okay, so the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna actually text two twos, three threes. Okay, put that in, two twos, three threes. And then once you get that in your text, you're gonna actually text Kelly Landon 200, which is my name, in order to get into the poll. You'll get a text saying you're part of the poll, and after that you can answer my question. What would you do with $1,000? I hope you guys get better service than I do. This software, by the way, is called Poll Everywhere. If you guys are presenting in class, I would definitely take a look at this. It's an awesome tool to get people engaged. Um, public speaking is tough for some people, and it's just another one of those tools to get people engaged and get conversation going. So Poll Everywhere, make sure you guys look it up. So someone will pay rent. Awesome. Oh, get travel, savings, not work next semester. And meth, oh god. <laughs> Um, <laughs> never seen that one before. Get a new phone, invest, pay off debt, pay for school, see if the money is actually for me, it would be actually for you, I love the skepticism. Groceries. Jet ski, awesome, that's fun. Hey, someone's birthday, does anyone want to cop to that, is anyone's birthday coming up? Oh yeah, two people in the back. You guys don't know each other already, get together, have a good party, okay? <laughs> Car payment, invest. Well, that's awesome, and I'm really excited to see that there was only one math response, so um, everything else was pretty responsible. So as you can see, when it comes to money, there's a variety of things that we'll do with it. Um, for many in this room, which I was very happy to see, you take the more responsible route, using it to pay off things, pay off bills, pay off debt. Others want to travel. And so when we're thinking about money as we go through the session, it's important to know that what we want you to be able to do is both do things like travel and have fun and get that jet ski and do other things and celebrate your birthday. But at the same time, we want to make sure you're saving for other important goals and saving for the rest of your life as well. So we'll come back to this little exercise throughout today's session, but we just wanted to get your juices going and see how everyone's feeling about money when it comes to people in this room. All right, so as I mentioned, we are 
are going to be focusing on five core money topics. And these particular topics are exactly a result of feedback from postgraduates who have told us, hey, I wish I had learned about this in college. Okay. The first, the B word, budgeting. Okay, budgeting. This is really making the most of what you've got, even when it's not that much to begin with. Second is credit. And this is really about using credit and boosting it to your advantage. The third is debt. And when it comes to debt, it's handling debt smartly and just alleviating a little bit of stress that comes with this D word. The fourth is investing. And when we think about investing, we really think about it in terms of long and short term goals. And the fifth and final piece is retirement. And for a college student, this feels like a million years off, but we just want you guys to start thinking about this now. So throughout this session, we have these huge placemat type things in front of you, okay? Placemat type things. This is your action plan. I'm going to be referring back to this throughout the session. And not only that, this is a great tool for, to refer back to after today's session. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, make sure you take a look at this. I do apologize for the size, but it's something you can take away. And this is something that, I'll, again, I'll keep referring to and giving you guys action items to take with you after I review each topic. All right, so let's get into budgeting. Really making the most of what you've got, even when it's not that much to begin with. So in terms of budgeting, has anyone felt shocked about how much they spent in a month? Yeah, how about a weekend? Yeah, it's called Monday, right? Yeah, you look at your credit card statement, and you're like, oh gosh, what did I do? Too much fun this weekend. Uh, I know I had this on Tuesday, actually, because I had a long weekend, which is, which is really nice. Um, has anyone got hit by an unexpected expense before? Yeah, I think all of us have done that, and we'll tell a few stories about that later. But this is budgeting. And when it comes to budgeting, this is really the foundation of everything. And when also when it comes to budgeting, I think sometimes when it comes to budgeting, people try to keep track of every single little thing they spend money on. Every single little thing. And the problem with that is, is that if you have a single slip up, it's very difficult to get up back on track. I really compare this to dieting. I don't know if anyone's ever gone on a diet or has friends who have dieted before. They're on a diet, they're eating healthy, they're eating healthy, and they go out on Friday night. So hungry because they've been dying all week. What do they do? They get a slice of pizza. Oh, well, I already had one slice of pizza. Might as well get another. Oh, I already had two slices of pizza. Might as well eat another. And before you know it, you've eaten the whole pie. Okay? That's what I like to think about budgeting. You don't need to keep track of every single little thing you spend money on because chances are if you do that, you're going to slip up eventually and that will set you back. Does anyone currently budget? Does anyone use Mint? Yeah, if you guys use Mint, that's awesome. Does anyone use an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, yeah, old reliable Excel, right? Um, does anyone use something else that I might not have heard of? No? Yeah? Well, if you do speak up or let me know after today's session. But if you guys are doing that, that's awesome. Keep on doing that. You are way ahead of the game. Keep doing what you're doing. And so what Fidelity's done, we've created a simple rule of thumb that can really help, it bu help you budget your money starting today and especially looking ahead into the future. First, let's actually look where all our money goes. We've bucketed it into four specific categories. Okay, the first is essentials. Does anyone want to give me an example of an essential? What is something you actually need to pay for? Yes, you and Rent. Rent, okay. Anyone want more? Yeah. Oh yeah, stand up. Lord Marine, marketing, uh, junior. Groceries. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> Girls gotta eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> and one more, Caesar in the back. Uh, yeah, gotta talk to people, right? And if you didn't pay your phone bill, you can participate in today's exercise. So thank you for that, Caesar. Um, so those are essentials. Those are things that you absolutely need to pay. Non-essentials, one of my favorite categories. Anyone give me an example of this? Yes, pink shirt. No, it's okay. Novelty, biology, senior, makeup. <laughs> okay, we're going to end with that one. <laughs> makeup. So things like makeup, things like shopping, things that might not necessarily need, but you really have them right now. Those are examples of those non-essentials. The next is short-term savings. Short-term savings, those are things like trips. Those are things like vacations, spring break, which will be coming up as, you know, before we know it, hopefully. Um, things like emergency funds, okay, which we'll talk about in a bit, and that's really to cover those expenses that you just don't expect. And the fourth and final, is anybody give me an example of a long-term expense? Yes. Uh, if you're going to go finance, sophomore, and I would say a house. Like yeah, awesome. Yeah, owning a house. And another big one, which we'll talk about soon, is retirement. Okay? So those are examples, and that's how we like to think of our money in terms of budgeting. Now let's get to our rule of thumb. Okay, I want you guys to remember this, and it's also on your action plan right there. So this is something you can take away with you. In terms of budgeting, we lump them into the 50-15-5 rule. Okay? 
50-15-5 rule. 50% of your take-home pay after taxes, so after Uncle Sam comes and takes some money from you, because we all know Uncle Sam does that, after he does that, 50% of that money left over should go to those essential items. Things like housing, things like your phone bill, things like groceries. After that, 15% goes to retirement. Now we're going to talk about retirement in a little bit more detail, but I think if I were you sitting in your seat when I was in college, if someone were to tell me 15% of my money went to retirement, I would think they were crazy. That's a lot of money. I was not making that much when I graduated college. And if someone were to tell me that, guess what? I just wouldn't have invested in my retirement. And guess what? I didn't. I had no idea what a 401k was when I graduated college. Because to be honest, no one told me. My parents are wonderful people. They know nothing about finance and they were not able to explain to me the importance of starting early. So does anyone want to tell me what a 401k is? Anyone know? Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, stand up. Billy Johnson, Executive Director of Professional Leadership Program, University of North Texas. Yeah, that's a mouthful. <laughs> that just took five minutes right there. <laughs> so we put retirement savings account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very, that's very good. But usually, it's usually sponsored by your employer, which is great. Most employers nowadays actually help you save your retirement, which is awesome. And a lot of times, you actually have to opt out of participating as opposed to opting in. We try to make it as easy as possible for you. So that 15% is not only the money that you're putting in, okay? not only the percentage of your paycheck you're putting in, it actually also includes the percentage of the match that your employer is putting in. So what a match is, it's money that your employer is also contributing to your retirement. So I'll use Fidelity for example. They actually contribute 7% of like my match to my retirement. 7%, which is a great number, and Fidelity is really good at that. So I myself am contributing 10%. So every month, 10% of my paycheck goes to my retirement. In addition to that 10%, Fidelity also puts in 7%. So that's a total of 17. So I'm actually doing very well compared to our budgeting goal right here. We actually say 10 to 15. But just so you know, that percentage is not only the money you're putting in, but the money your employer's putting in. And I'm going to state a rule right now that we'll talk a little bit, little bit more when we get to retirement. Always take advantage of the match. Okay? Does everyone get that? always take advantage of that match, because you know what that is? That is free money. Free money. Does anyone here not like free money? Okay, if I were to give you that $1,000 just right off the bat, would you just say no? No strings attached, this is yours. Would you say no to that? Maybe the guy in the back, he's shaking his head or something, but that's only one guy out of all of you guys. Never say no to free money. And that's what that is. So always take advantage of your match. And that's really what that 15% encompasses. The fifth and final piece is savings, and this is specifically short-term savings. Specifically when it comes to your, to your emergency fund, which we'll get into soon, and other things like trips and things like that. So that's really where this 5% comes into. This bucket is really meant to cover you in case anything unexpected happens. Now, for all the math, finance people in the room, what percent is that? Okay, how much is left over? 30, okay, 30%. That 30%, you guys, is for you. If you follow this rule and you do this correctly, you will have 30% left over, and that's for all of you guys. You're in college now, and I'm sure you're having fun, but guess what, you should continue to have fun. You should continue to live the life you want, and that's where that 30% comes in. So if you follow this rule to the best of your ability, you can use that 30% to whatever you want. Buy that makeup, go for it, you know, take that trip, have fun, go out with your friends. And that's why we give you a little bit of breathing room. So action plan, right here. You can take this with you. Take a look at how you step up. Take a look at your budget. If you're not currently doing something, if you're not using that Excel spreadsheet, if you're not using Mint, Fidelity is a tool called Cinch, go try to do something today. Do you need to keep track of every single little thing you spend it on? No, and we're not saying you to do that. Just try to do something, and you'll be far better off tomorrow if opposed to today. All right, let's get into credit. So I'm gonna tell you guys a little story about credit. Um, I didn't have a credit card in college. Do you guys have a credit card? Does everyone have a credit card in this room? Some of you guys, yeah, some of you guys don't, okay. So I didn't have a credit card in college. And when I graduated, I was going, I was gonna live in Boston with a friend, everything was great, we got approved for an apartment, landlord was like great, awesome. And they're like, okay, you're all set. Uh, you just need to have your dad co-sign. I was like, what do you mean co-sign? Didn't know what that was. They're like, well, you don't have any credit. And I was like, yeah, I have credit, I have a debit card from Citizens Bank. That's not credit. I had zero credit to my name. So even though I was making money, I had a job, I had money saved up, 
I look completely untrustworthy in the eyes of my landlord. And as a result, I needed to have my dad co-sign, and he needed to be responsible for me in case I had a slip up. Because my landlord doesn't know me from Caesar. Me and Caesar are the same in my landlord's eyes. He doesn't know the difference. So he needs to use my credit history as a means to understand how trustworthy I am for him to rent his place. And I didn't have any credit. So we're gonna talk about credit today. In terms of credit, it's the credit you use and the credit you build. Credit you use and the credit you build. And these actually go hand in hand. How you use your credit and if you're being responsible with it, that can help you build your credit. Vice versa, how you build your credit can determine how you use future credit to get a place, to buy a car, to buy a house, things like that. And also in terms of credit, you never ever want to spend beyond your means. I'm gonna go over some of the important reasons why credit is a good thing, but always remember, always remember, when you do get that credit card, treat it like a debit card. Never spend more money than you actually physically have in your bank. Always think of it as a debit card. But first we're gonna actually go over something called the credit score. I don't think anyone has ever reviewed this for me, and we're going to actually share this with you guys right now. What's great about credit is that you can actually have a hand, and you can actually have an influence of what your credit score looks like and how trustworthy you look like in the eyes of others who may want you to lend you credit in the future. So the first and the most important piece of your credit score is payment history, and this is how you're repaying your debt. Are you paying your bills on time, and are you paying at least the minimum? And if you can, always try to pay more than the minimum. This is actually the thing that credit bureaus look at most, and this has the most impact on your credit score. Are you paying on time, and you're paying at least the minimum, if not more? The second puzzle is credit utilization. Okay, credit utilization is really how much of your available credit you're spending. And this is when the rule of 30 comes in. The rule of 30. You should never be spending more than 30% of your available credit limit. Let's say you have $2,000 at your credit limit. If you're constantly spending $1,800, $1,900, $2,000, that actually reflects poorly on you. In the eyes of the credit bureau, they actually think that you're not managing your money responsibly, and you're constantly teetering on the edge to spending more than you possibly can afford. That's credit utilization. So the rule of 30, 30%. Never spend more than 30% of the available credit to you. The next piece is length of history. So unfortunately, using my example, the length of my history isn't that long. I've been out of college now for eight years. So the length of my credit card history is eight years. In the grand scheme of things, that's not that great. In fact, if I go and look at my credit score, something that's not making me get top marks, because I, I luckily do have good credit, is the length of my history. I haven't had a credit card for that long. I also didn't have student loans when I was an undergrad. I didn't get them to graduate school. Student loans as well is another form of credit history, and I just didn't have them. So that's actually a ding on me. And one of the most important things that I was told when I first got my credit card is always hold on to that credit card. Always hold on to your first credit card. Even if you do not use it, that first credit card could determine your credit history. So my first credit card is actually a Capital One. When I first got it, it was a $500 limit, and I got zero rewards. I got, it was nothing. Um, and for now, it's actually a $2,000 limit, so again, it hasn't really bumped up that much. But I still hold on to that card because that determines my credit history because I actually wasn't able to get another credit card until four years after that. So if I got rid of my Capital One, if I just canceled it and stopped using it, that would actually cut my credit history in half, and again, that would reflect very poorly against me. So always hold on to that first credit card, even if you don't really use it, or you use it for a single purchase every month. The fourth piece is credit mix. Yes? Uh, Clara Warner, I'm a disciplinary art and design uh, senior. So does it not reflect poorly on your credit if you are idle on a credit card? Like if you keep it for a number of years and don't use it, does that not ding your history as well? No, it doesn't. You can be idle on it, but just make sure you're paying it off. So don't like have a balance on it that you have paid off for eight years. Just hold on to that credit card. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah so you can hold on to it. Because I, I honestly, I don't think I've used that credit card in three months. That's how long it's been. So the fourth and final piece is credit mix. And what credit mix is really the mix of credit you have to your name. So I already mentioned credit cards. I already mentioned student loans. Some people have mortgages. Some people have car payments. This is your credit mix. And actually, if you have a few different pieces of credit or debts under your name, that actually looks really good to credit lenders. Because how they view that is that you're able to manage responsibly different forms of credit. However, you must also manage those responsibly. If you have four different types of credit and you're just failing to repay it on every single one, 
that's going to be very bad for you. But if you have a few different pieces of credit, say your student loans and your credit card, and you're constantly paying those off and paying your student loan payments on time, that's great. And that will reflect very positively on your credit score. The fifth and final piece is new credit. New credit. So with new credit, what this really means is that credit lenders do not want to see you constantly reapplying for a new credit card. If you're constantly reapplying for a new credit card, what that looks like to credit lenders is that you cannot handle your money. You cannot afford everything on your single credit card, so you need another credit card, and you need another credit card, and you need another credit card. And that is actually very poorly reflected on your credit score. Now, some of you who may not have a credit card in this room, I've not had this question asked to me. Okay, well, how can I apply for a credit card if, if I'm gonna get dinged for that? There's actually grace periods set aside, so let's say you need a new credit card and it just happens to be the same month as your mortgage. There are certain grace periods that kind of are lapse of this. I won't get too big of details, but there is ways and there are kind of provisions with credit that can kind of work around this a little bit. But for the most part, what I really want you to remember about this fifth and final slice is that if you're constantly applying for new credit and you're constantly trying to get new credit cards, they will know, they will see, and that will poorly affect your credit card. Credit score, excuse me. Yes. Reggie Davis, Logistics Supply Chain Senior. Hey, Reggie. Um, so about <coughs> the credit utilization and new credit. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you could spend close to your um, credit limit, but you always paid on time, um, would it would it be a, a scenario where you should apply for a bigger line of credit, or should you just continue to you know spend the way you spend? Yeah. So um, I think it's it's really up to you personally. And what happens a lot is that credit card companies, and this just actually just recently happened to me, if they see that you're maybe using up to your credit limit but you're constantly repaying it on time, they'll automatically bump that up, which is great, and that's positive, and that won't poorly reflect against you. You also have the opportunity to do that, um, and that doesn't necessarily fall into the new credit category because you're not applying for a completely new credit line. Um, but again, it kind of just depends on you personally and how responsible you think you can be with your credit. And I think falling into the same category, a lot of people ask me what credit card they should get. Honestly, I can't recommend a credit card. I, I just can't do that for compliance reasons and other reasons. That's personally up to all of you guys. If you think that you can constantly repay your balances on time, paying off the minimum and more, then maybe look into a credit card that has certain rewards, travel perks, because often that carries a higher rate of interest than others. If you are worried about paying off your credit card debt on time, then maybe get a credit card with very low interest, which may not have the rewards. It just completely depends on you. And the best part is, is that you may have the opportunity, kind of like me, my Capital One had zero rewards, but very low interest. And I was worried when I first got out of college. But then four years later, I was able to get an Amex who has excellent rewards, because now I can luckily pay off my bills on time. So it just kind of depends on you. Did you have a question in the back? Yeah, we're going to get to that in like a second. Yeah, and that's a, that's kind of a big thing to watch out for. Sorry about this. My throat's a little dry from all the travel today. So we're going to get to that in a second. And this is really where it comes in when it's checking your credit card health. And this is part of the action plan right before you, okay? So you guys can refer back to this. In terms of credit, like I've already said, there's a lot you can actually do to improve your credit score as well as build your credit score. And these are just five steps right here that can really help with that. So the first is check your credit health. Once a year, FICO actually allows you to get a credit report for free. However, and this is the great thing, and I'll use Amex for example, because that's a credit card I primarily use, a lot of times you can actually go on and check your credit every time you log into your account. Um, does anyone have Discover? I know that's a popular card for students. Yeah, so Discover, for example. Not only if you're a Discover member, you can do that each and every time. Even if you don't have a Discover card, you can go in and check your credit score right now. If you go home today and you check your credit and you log on to Discover, there's actually availability to check your credit score, even if you don't necessarily have a Discover card, so you can go ahead and do that if you'd like. Credit Karma, does anyone know Credit Karma? Yeah, you can do that. They actually have a very funny commercial of something I just said, this woman who was just stuck living with her parents forever because she had no credit and she couldn't move out on her own. So, so check your credit health, and this is an action item I would suggest all of you guys to do when you get home today. The second is build credit as needed. As I've already mentioned, sometimes no credit can be just as detrimental to you as poor credit. Um, for example, my example, I wasn't able to rent a home. I wasn't able to have that essential expense to my name because I didn't have any credit. So build credit as needed. If you're concerned, do more research, ask more questions, go and talk to your parents if you can, open a card with them. There's a lot you can do with it. 
You don't need to leave this room and go get a credit card. We're not saying that. But just begin to think of one and build that credit as you hit. The next is check your debt load. And again, this is that 30% rule, 30%. Never spend more than 30% of your available credit limit. That's checking your debt load. Fourth, read the fine print. And that's actually what, our, what I was alluding to with your question in the back. A lot of times what credit cards will do is they will actually say, you know, the first year, um, no fees, uh, zero interest for the six months, but then what happens after the first year? Okay, you have to pay a $500 fee, your, your debt, excuse me, your interest goes up to 8%, and they might actually increase your limit so much it actually reflects poorly on you. And that's where reading the fine print comes in. Because what happens if that does happen? Let's say you get a credit card, first year's awesome, and then, oh wait, you didn't read the fine print, you have to pay $500 a year to have a credit card? That's ridiculous. But then you go and cancel that credit card. And then what happens is, you're restarting the length of your history. So always read the fine print. Always read the fine print. And the fifth and final piece is pay on time and pay at least the minimum. As we saw looking at our credit score, 35% of our credit score is made up of just this, our payment history. So always pay um, on time and always pay at least the minimum, but if you can, pay even more than that. So credit in terms of action plan, once again, uh, take a look at this, go have discussions, go ask questions, go do some research. We're not telling you guys to go get a credit card after today's class, we're just asking you to start to think about this. Yeah, we're going to do two questions, we kind of have to ask them kind of quick, we might leave them to the end, but go ahead and ask this. Yeah. In terms of reading the fine print, what do you look at to know if this is a good credit card or a bad credit card? Like, what are the staples to check? Yeah, so honestly, I can't really answer that directly. Yeah, um, no, mostly just because I can't tell you personally, Joseph, what would be a good credit card for you. I just kind of can't get into that. So I kind of alluded that to a little bit. It really depends on you. Um, and, you know, I'll just give a few examples. That $500, you should not be paying $500 a year for a credit card, especially when you're straight out of college. Um, when you're going to be a millionaire in 10 years, go for it. You know, there are, there are credit cards that can, that can do that. You should never be paying 8% in or more of interest. That's ridiculous, and no one straight out of college should be doing that. So there's certain things like that. Um, you should start with a lower credit limit when you're straight out of college. That can help you manage your finances a little bit better than not. Um, so there's a few different things, and it depends on your age, depends on your personality, depends on the job you get. Um, and so I can't get too specific, so I hope that was, I hope that was a little bit helpful. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I wasn't sure if you were going to mention this, but I'm an international student and I had no credit, so mm -hmm. I had to get what was called a secure card. So you put like $500 down and then they give you that limit of like $500, mm -hmm. and then that's how I started building my credit. And then after that, I had it for a year, and then I applied for another credit card, and they gave me like a $1,500 limit, and I started building an actual credit from there. So if you don't have any credit, or you don't have like a like somebody co-signing you, like mm -hmm. you know your parents knowing what you buy or anything like that, <laughs> uh, you can get like a secured card. Like uh -huh. a job no, that's great. I, I wasn't going to mention that because I, I don't know too much, especially about international students. So I do apologize. Um, I do know from many of my international friends when in my MBA program that was a real struggle for them coming over here. I couldn't even get a cell phone, um, which is tough. Uh, is anyone else an international student? A few guys, so I'm sorry that I can't answer this as well, but if you guys have more questions, I can find out for you, so make sure to come see me after, okay? We'll, we'll figure it out together. Okay, so we're going to go into debt. Debt. I'm going to be honest with you, debt stinks. It's not fun. It's just not a fun thing, and it's a cause of so much stress in so many people's lives. And so what we've done is we've actually put together um, a six-step plan dealing with debt to just help alleviate a little bit of that stress and make it easier for all of you guys. So I think in terms of debt, a lot of times when people think debt, they forget such an important piece of debt. And that important piece is savings. Savings and debt actually go hand in hand. I mean, I think we can all think of a time if we had just saved a little bit more in one respect, how much quicker we could have paid off our debt. So savings and debt, saving and debt. We want you guys to start to think about it in this way. It's very different because a lot of times you just hear, pay off your debt, pay off your debt. But if you don't have the money to pay off your debt, you're just going to have to take out more debt and more debt. And then you're just going to keep on going down that hole. So we've actually created a six-step process to help you guys think about debt, which is a little different than I'm sure most of you guys heard. But always remember, savings and debt really go hand in hand. Okay, number one is build an emergency fund. I've talked about this a few times already. 
What an emergency fund is, it's really money set aside in case anything bad happens. Uh, the example I'd like to use for this is my friend Emily. Emily and her boyfriend moved in together. You know, they had a great year living together and then everything went wrong. And they broke up and Emily had to move out. So unfortunately in Boston, you have to pay your first month's rent, last month's rent, security deposit, and realtor fee. And if you're looking at a $2,500 apartment, that's $10,000 right then and there. Who has $10,000? Anyone in this room? Yeah? Okay, well keep your hands down because that would make me feel bad if you guys had ten thousand dollars. <laughs> but Emily, it's luckily for Emily that she actually had an emergency fund. She had money set aside in case anything happened. And lucky for her, she was able to get out of her situation and find a great apartment that separated her from her boyfriend, which is good. And that's unfortunately, you know, life happens, things happen. Um, in fact, a funny story about this that I'll, t I'll tell you guys real quickly. In front of you, you also have a survey, which we are going to ask you guys to fill out after today's session. One of the questions we asked you is, what's the biggest takeaway today? And I presented in front of a group of interns from North Carolina a few weeks ago, and someone wrote, never move in with your boyfriend before marriage. So um, I thought that funny. I hope you guys take away more than just that. But um, Number two is contributing up to the match in your 401k. Again, notice we haven't even talked about paying up debt yet. So contribute up to the match in your 401k. As we already mentioned, a 401k is employee-sponsored retirement. They help you save for retirement. And as I already told you, number one thing, when you get into that situation, never say no to your match. Never leave free money on the table. Always contribute up to your match. So for example, I'll use Fidelity again. They do a 7% match. You only get that 7% if you yourself contribute 7%. So if you work for a company that contributes 3%, if you contribute 3%, you get that match. If you don't contribute up to that match, so let's say they do 3%, but you're only contributing 2%, you don't get that money. That's the key. You don't get that money. So always make sure you're contributing up to that match. If you work for an employer and they give 3%, what are you guys going to also contribute? 3%. Okay. You're not going to contribute 2 You're going to contribute, what did you say again? 3%. All right. Okay. So that's step number two. Number three is paying up high interest credit cards. Now, as we already looked at in our previous section with credit, 35% of your credit score is determined by your payment history. So what you must always do, step number three, is tackle those high interest credit cards first. Because what happens is this is actually how credit card, pay, credit card companies get paid. If you're not able to pay off your credit card on time, you're gonna keep accumulating interest, accumulating interest, and taking on more debt. So we actually say to pay off those high interest credit cards before tackling student loans and before tackling government student loans because usually that interest is a little bit lower. Also when it comes to certain type of loans, you can deduct those from your taxes as well. You can never deduct credit card debt from your taxes. So number three, tackle your high interest credit cards first. And look at that interest. We always use that rule of eight. Try not to get a credit card with 8%, but if you have that credit card 8% or higher, tackle that first. Number four, pay off private student loans. I'm not sure how many people in this room have student loans. I know that is such a common occurrence. In fact, 42% of all millennials actually have student loans. And usually most people have a combination of private and federal or government student loans. Typically private student loans, they actually have a higher interest rate than the government or federal student loans. Similar to credit cards, you often cannot deduct the interest off your private student loans. So again, we tell you to tackle those first. Tackle those first before getting to your federal or government student loans. So number five and six, and I'm gonna show you guys a really brief video on this so you can also have a break from hearing my voice. Before you even tackle those lower interest loans, we want you to contribute more to your 401k. And why we say this is that the contributing more to your 401k can actually benefit more in the long term than tackling those lower interest loans. Because when it comes to student debt and when it comes to student loans, often they're more emotional than anything else. And if you can bump up a percentage of your 401k, that may pay off more for you in the long term than completely paying off the lowest of your low in terms of student loans. We're going to show a very brief two minute video and we have a woman named Jean Chatsky. She actually talks about this and she explains the importance of looking at it in this way. Do you have a plan of attack? 
<laughs> Not really. <laughs> I feel like you're just thrown out into this ocean of financial decisions. I mean, uh, my goal is to just like pay pay off the debt as, as I can as soon as possible. What sort of interest rates do you have on these loans? Uh, it's 3.8, uh, 3.9, somewhere in there. These student loan debts, although they weigh really heavily on you emotionally, <laughs> They're not costing you all that much money. When you hear people say, pay off your debt, pay off your debt, they're often talking about high interest rate credit card debt. But you got a student loan at 3.8% and it's tax deductible. So I worry about people trying to just bulldoze their way out of student loan debt at the expense of their future. The question you have to ask yourself is, should I hustle to pay that off as fast as I can, or would I be better off paying that off on the schedule that they give me, but taking any extra money that I can come up with and investing it for the future? Would, would the return on my money actually be better by putting some money in a work-based retirement plan or in an IRA and putting it in the market where it can grow? more spread it out and try to try yeah. to plan for, for the present and the, the future. At the same time, okay. if you can. And if you find that it's really difficult and you can't save anything for your future, then you want to look into an income-based repayment sort of plan where they'll cap your payments based on your income. And that will allow you the freedom to put some money away for emergencies and put some money away for the future. So having had this kind conversation. Like, what's your approach going to be? My goal is to change the world uh, in whatever ways I can. It will be important to take some money and put aside uh, for those future endeavors. It's not all about just like paying down your debt. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. So. That's good. Cool. So the point of that is really just although the cost of loans and debt can weigh very heavily on you, in the long term it can sometimes benefit you even more to put a little bit more away for your future as opposed to thinking here and now and just paying off that debt. So really the main um, action items when you're thinking about debt is always think about debt and savings hand in hand. You never want to be in the position where you have to take on more debt because you didn't save for those unexpected emergencies or you didn't save for your future. So investing in retirement, we have two more sections, and these really go hand in hand, because to be honest, often it's retirement that is the very first step for most people when it comes to investing. And at Fidelity, in terms of investing, we really like to think about it in terms of long and short-term goals. The great thing about everyone in this room is that you're young. You have a lot of time to grow your money. You have a lot of time to invest. I think we've all seen the stock market go like this. This is like how I think of the stock market often, ups and downs, ups and downs. But what's great about starting early and about starting young is that you actually have the opportunity to kind of weather the ebbs and flows of the stock market, and you can do so by readjusting your portfolio depending on your age, as well as readjusting some of your goals in terms of investing depending on some of your long-term goals. So when it comes to investing, really the key is compounding. The whole point of compounding is returns on top of returns on top of returns. So you're making money not, on, not just on the initial money you put in, but any money that you make as a result to that. Compounding, returns on top of returns. And we're gonna see an excellent example of compounding in just a second. So in terms of investing, like I said, we think of long and short-term goals. Short-term goals are those vacations that we talked about. Well, a long-term goal is buying a house or saving for retirement. So these in front of you, are, these are actually different types of investments, okay? So on the lower risk, which is often associated with those short-term goals, we have cash. Cash is the safest form or the safest way to keep all your money. The only problem with cash is that if you have all your money in cash, you're putting yourself at the risk of inflation. We all heard the term inflation before. Yeah, so when I think of inflation, I honestly, I think of my grandmother. Um, she always likes to talk about how when she was growing up, a gallon of milk was 50 cents, and now it's $3. Does everyone else have grandparents like that? Yeah, or hey, my loaf of bread costs a dollar, and now it's five dollars, or you know, whatever it is nowadays. That's inflation. The cost of goods today will not be the same cost tomorrow, or five years from now, or 10 years from now. So what that really means is that if you keep all your money in cash, what you might be able to afford today, you won't be able to afford five to 10 years down the line, because inflation will often change the cost of goods. So that's when we think of cash. 
Cash is very safe. Cash is where you should keep your emergency fund because you can easily take it out. But at the same time, you always run the risk of inflation. In the middle, we have our bonds. Bonds are fixed income. And really what a bond is, it's a loan that you actually give a government, a municipality, a corporation. You're actually loaning them money. Okay, and that's called the principal. And what they say is that in return of the principal today, so if you loan me $1,000 today, I will pay you back an initial $1,000 in 10 years, plus any interest earned on that. Okay? So you're loaning the money today, you'll get that back in 10 years, but you'll also get additional money depending on the interest that that loan actually accumulates. And so that's relatively safe and that's what sits in the middle because the corporation or the government is guaranteeing you that principal back. But the other thing is, it is more of a long-term investment. You're not going to take out a bond on a Monday and get it back on a Friday. And on our higher risks, we have our stocks or equities. And when it comes to our stocks or equities, these are a little bit more risky. This is what we think of when we think of the stock market. The other thing with these is this actually has the highest rate of return. And because you're young, you are able to weather the ebbs and flows of the stock market. The stock market has actually had about a 7% rate of return over the past 10 years, which is great. And I think that sometimes we just always hear about the negative. I know the Dean, that's what she talked about before, all the stories are the negative stories. But because you're young, you can actually start a little bit earlier and you can get in there early, get in the game. So we're gonna quickly do one more example when it comes to retirement. Um, and this is actually gonna show you what getting in the game and starting early can do for all of you guys. So I actually need two volunteers from the audience. Okay, blue shirt and how about you right there? You, um, blue blazer. Yes, I'm sorry, and what's your name? Okay, come on to the front, you guys. And what this is going to show is this is just going to show you guys the importance of starting early, the importance of investing, and what actually getting involved in the stock market can do. Okay, so what's your name? Uchella. Uchella? Uchella. Uchella. Awesome. What's your name? Bonnie. Okay, Bonnie. <laughs> say here, so it's a little your name. Um, does everyone know Bonnie and Uchella? Yeah? You guys want to say hi to them? Hi, guys. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to start with Bonnie over here. When Bonnie's 35, Bonnie says, you know what? I'm going to start to invest in my retirement. I'm going to get in the game, and I'm going to open up an IRA, which is an individual retirement account. I'm going to put, uh, let's say, 5500 every year in your IRA, starting at 35, and we're going to assume about a 7% rate of return. So when Bonnie turns 70, and she's ready to retire and go have fun and live the life she's always thought about, she has almost $800,000 in her IRA. Bonnie, what do you think of that amount of money? Pretty good? You like happy about that? Okay, yeah, awesome. So anyway, so we have Uchella over here. Uchella, unlike Bonnie who didn't start till 35, Uchella at 25 is like, you know what? I'm gonna get in the game. I heard like this crazy talk from this crazy girl from Boston and she told me to start early. I'm gonna open an IRA. So Uchella at age 25 does the same exact thing as Bonnie over here. She puts 5,500 into that account each and every year, and she gets a 7% rate of return on that account. So Uchella, when she's 70, she's like, okay, let's go, let's retire, I'm done, I'm tired, I don't wanna work anymore. Can anyone guess what Uchella has in her account at age 70? Everyone wanna guess? Just yell them out. Two million. Two million. Is it two million? Anyone else? Anything higher than two million? 2.5. 2.5 million? Okay, Uchella, wanna see how you do? All right. Uchella was 1.7 million. So Uchella, she started 10 years earlier. She did the same exact thing as Bonnie. And she's making double the amount of money that Bonnie did when she's ready to retire. Okay, so let's look at Bonnie, Uchella, Bonnie. I'm sorry, Bonnie. So really the point of today's exercise, and thank you guys for being such great sports, is that, oh wait, 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 you're missing the punchline, guys. You always want to be Uchella, and you never want to be Bonnie. Okay, now give them a round of applause. Now, we like to use that funny little example um, because we just like to show you how important it is to start early. So when it comes to retirement, you're young. It feels very far off. And I'm just about out of time, so I can answer some more questions about this after. But really what you want to do is get in the game. Open that account. Usually with the 401k, which we really spent a lot of time on today, you can't get that until you start working. It's an employer-sponsored retirement plan. But right now, if you wanted to, you could open an IRA. You could open a Roth IRA, which are two great investment vehicles for people your age. You can be Uchella. You don't have to wait to be bumpy. You can get in that game early. So you want to open that account. You need to make it automatic. Make it as easy as possible for yourselves. Meet that match if you get it, and if possible. And bump up those contributions. 
Each and every year, usually there's an automatic contribution. It bumps it up by a percentage. But a great time to do so is if you get a raise, you get a bonus. Bump that up. We also the importance of starting early and putting a little bit more into your account. So that ends our session today. Um, for more information, we do have a link on your action plan. Uh, and again, the most important takeaways today, because I know I gave you a lot of information and we were kind of rushed there at the end, is that just start thinking about these things now. If you guys have parents, if you have professors, if you have someone at Fidelity you even want to talk to, please let us know and ask those questions. Get in the game early, start early. Because you know what, when you turn 70, and when you are older, you're going to want to do fun things. You want to want to have a blast with your friends and family. But you also want to make sure you're financially stable. And really, we want you to be able to do both. So if you guys have any questions, um, let me know. Do you want to do a few minutes of Q&A, or they'll just come after? Yeah, yeah, OK, so we'll do a few minutes of Q&A. Um, and I can pass this around, or people can just yell real loud. Um, and then also, if we run out of time, I'll stay here, stick around for another hour or two, OK? Yes. Purple tie. Uh, Edgar and Gail, uh Yeah, no, no, and that's exactly right. I mean, there's there's never any guarantee. There's always a risk associated with the stock market. But what the great thing is, is that if you're starting early, you are able to weather those kind of bottoms that the stock market's going to have. The stock market is not always going to go like this. And I think kind of to your second point in regards to, um, you know, you have to make sure you're actively managing your money, you're asking questions. I mean, that's really on an individual. Or if you're lucky, which is kind of nice, some companies, you can actually have your retirement managed by a professional from Fidelity or another company. But it's really um, up to you, you know, depending on your profile and how risky you are and your age. You can actually work with someone to determine how your portfolio should be mixed. So I'll just give you one example because we kind of glossed over this a little bit in lieu of time. In terms of investments, when you start and when you're young, the majority of your, profile, uh, your portfolio, that's going to be mostly stocks. They are a little bit risky, but as I said, because you're younger, you can weather kind of the ebbs and flows of the stock market a little bit more. So the majority of your portfolio would most likely be stocks, a few bonds, and very little cash. But as you get older, that mix would actually change. So you'd have very little in stocks, some more in bonds, and then more in cash. Because as you're getting closer to retirement, you want to guarantee that money's there, exactly what you said. Cash, as we said, is the safest form of investing. It can kind of just sit there. But as you get closer to retirement, having it more in cash is not as bad as if you're young and you're uh, running the risk of inflation. So I think that's a great point, and that's so important when we're thinking about investing. I was petrified of investing. Sometimes I still am, um, to be honest with you. I mean, I just think that's how I am. I'm not a risky person. Um, but at the same time, I've seen the, um, like I just showed you an example right there, a 7% rate of return up to the past 10 years. And I've also seen the benefits of starting young and getting in that game early, and how much money you can actually lose and detriment to yourself if you don't get in there early. So, but I think that's a good question and a very important point. Um, can you speak to that? Can you speak to that? Yeah, do you want to It's just more like banking. The communication that maybe when you talk about losing money, and we have to give that tonight, that's not a program to put you on the spot, but I want to make sure there's an understanding that, you know, if you can read something, you realize somebody invested in something lost all their money. There is integrity in, in, in the system. And so that's why I'm yeah. doing it. But again, I don't think you got a spot. Yeah, so FDIC, I often think more when it comes to banking versus the stock market. A, a bank will guarantee well, well, you. Yeah. I can have money that's FDIC protected. That's all. But I don't want to go on that path. Yeah. We can talk later about that. I just want you guys to leave here thinking, you know, there's either there's making money and I can be mm -hmm. Bonnie or, 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 you know, or miss you. We're going to see you after. <laughs> <laughs> or there's nothing. So I, I yeah. just want to make sure because there's a lot of misinformation. You guys can get all the facts all yeah. the time. So let's, let's Yeah, we'll talk about that after, but I, I do think that's a good point. I mean, Fidelity and most financial service companies, you have to, you're never going to do anything that's at risking the customer. We actually have, I know if we have compliance, we take license, we take tests in order to guarantee that we're never doing anything to the detriment of our customer. So that's a good point. Sorry. I have a question about the 50, 15, and 5. Uh -huh. um, what if you're straight out of college and your essentials exceed 50%? Okay. 
recommend? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, that, that it's very likely that that will happen. And that's really just a baseline, you know, guideline in order to ensure that you're, you're kind of keeping track of everything. Um, the 15% with retirement, that is high. We usually say 10 to 15%, depending on the age you're at. Um, the 5%, and that's usually that emergency fund. I think sometimes you'll hear of okay, getting three to six months of an emergency fund saved. Got to be honest with you, if you can put $25 away a month, do it. If you can put $25 away every two months, do that. There's got to be a compromise now and then. So I think that while it's a guideline, it's not super strict. And I think too, kind of similar with the way portfolios work, as you get older, as you make more money, you'll be able to get more in those guidelines, which is good. So. Hey guys, we're out of time for right now. Like Kelly said, she'll be available for questions yeah. right out here. So can we all give her a hand? We thank you for some flying in. Your yeah, no, of course. <laughs> Mike told us he's going to bring a big gun. I'm going to fly you in. Oh, no, of course. Uh, yeah. Mark's comments earlier. We do thank you guys because this relationship that we have with each other, it's all a strategic relationship to me. To, to have that time investment, I've had to do the travel mm -hmm. and fly in and out, uh, do those sort of things and bring other resources. So we appreciate that. And then if you guys will go out this way, you can hang out for a while because we have another class coming out. Well, we have another class.